all those key buzzwords that we're hearing right now, competency-based learning, um, prior learning assessment, adaptive learning, I, I do think that that's something that we're going to see more of um, because it's appealing for adult students, right? So if you're, again, looking at that student who's not, who's maybe got some college credits but they didn't finish or, you know, their life is just too busy to go through a traditional type of program, um, they're drawn to these competency-based and these other types of assessments, like the PLAs, the prior learning assessment programs. So I think what we're gonna see in the next five to 10 years is a lot more of the competency-based programs emerging and, and having those kind of options. More skill-based, I think we're gonna see a lot more programs come out that are focused on job skills. And I know that's controversial, some people don't like that, but I think that's what the students are wanting. I think learners will take control of what they learn. I think competency-based learning, digital badging, uh, will lead to a modularis modularization of content and skill development and so on. And people will assemble unique, uh, be sort of like eating from a buffet rather than you know, having a meal delivered to you one course after another. Competency-based, flexible programs that are out there seem to be growing at about 30% per year, while other institutions seem to be fading, having trouble uh, making ends meet. And uh, the online world, you don't have to build the fancy rec rooms and build the country club environment, which raises cost and raises, you know, increases your uh, financial instability. Your loan ratio goes way up, and so I think that my money would be on investing in online, investing in different ways. So it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all. There are different kinds of learners out there who would choose different kinds of programs. <clears throat> so let's not walk away from the degree, but let's start offering things that are much smaller than degrees, much smaller than courses. So it could be that we still have this concept of a degree and that after a certain accumulation of credits, badges, things over time, you say, okay, you've got this now. Your speaker this afternoon, David Wiley, um, when badging, the idea of badging first came out, he proposed in his blog, uh, he had a, a, a blog post called Or Equivalent. And he said, people say, I want a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Let's figure out what that means. And let's create a set of badges that are the equivalent to a bachelor's degree. So his proposal was, let's sit down with employers and let's have them tell us, what do you mean? What do you, what do you think is the equivalent of a bachelor's degree? What do you care about in terms of you know, communication skills? What do they have to be able to do? And what do you care about in terms of global perspectives? And what do you care about in terms of systems thinking and so on? And let's create that. So it could be that we define someone with a bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, whatever, can do these things. And what if we award that the way we do, really, uh, uh, honorary doctorate degrees? We give honorary doctorates away. It's, the, it's supposed to be the most you know, difficult, highest prestige degree, but we give those away to people who demonstrate that they have those skills. Well, what if we allow people to, as they go through life, you know, pick up some educational credentials and real life experience and then end up documenting, yeah, you have it. You, you have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. Or we can just lose that altogether and say, you have you are a systems thinker, you are able to communicate, you are globally aware, and uh, maybe we don't need the, the bigger names for those things. What we haven't really seen yet uh, is we're still pretty much in an asynchronous mode, and I think that the, the next few years of online learning is gonna be more with synchronous meetings as well, and recorded synchronous meetings for people who can't be there at the same time, but place with tools like Zoom and Google Hangouts and. Adobe Connect, it's more and more possible to connect people even with relatively simple uh, connections from laptops with webcams and so on to do an audio video thing and no longer will people be saying, well, you, I don't like teaching online because I can't see their expressions and I can't, I can't know what they're thinking and all that. So I hope that as that happens, we don't lose the advantage we currently have, which is that in online learning, almost everybody participates. I ask a question online in face to face and I get one person answering the rest to sort of wait for that. If you ask a question online you can get many answers and people have a chance to think before they answer. So I still like asynchronous things for some uh, outcomes but synchronous uh, is great for other opportunities too. You can role play and so on. One 
colleague that I think we're all very aware of is George Siemens, and George Siemens and Dragon Gasovic, um, and uh, Carolyn Rose from Pitt, they teamed up to do a, a MOOC on data, big data and data analytics. And they used a, a connectivist sort of a model where people would set their own goals and then they would submit evidence against those goals. There were, there were some goals that the instructors offered that you could sign up for, but then you could create your own goals. And then you would compile evidence that you had met the goals, whether they were teacher created or your own, and you would select people to be your reviewers, peer reviewers, based on data that was in their profiles. So you could choose by geography. It would recommend people like you based on things that you mentioned and so on. And that whole connectivist philosophy, I think, has a lot to offer. It's very, it's very difficult to make happen, especially when people have been conditioned to a behaviorist kind of an experience. And a lot of people who come to a class think that's what it's gonna be. And they didn't necessarily come there because of that new approach. So there are obstacles to overcome, but I think that in this decade and the next, we'll start to recognize that people do come in with unique backgrounds and with unique expectations and unique uh, desires from a course. Instead of a major, students will have a mission. So you won't come here and be a poli-sci major. You'll come here and you'll, you're, you'll be, your goal will be to eliminate poverty in Cleveland, right? And then you will put together a set of experiences based on your goal of, put, of eliminating poverty in Cleveland. Let's put together some resources and some learning experiences and some people that will help you get there. And another project, another group of people said, had a concept of looping. So you don't come here for four years and then go away and be an alum. You come in and out of Stanford for a period that might end up being equivalent to six years, but it's across your lifespan. So you'd come in saying, I want to, if I put those two things together in my head, you come in with a mission. I want to learn how to eliminate poverty in Cleveland. So you come in and they put you in touch with, you'll need a, a sociology class and you'll want to work with this center and do this and this while you're here. So you come in to Stanford for a while, then you go out and try it. And let's go do some things in Cleveland. And then let's come back in. I might reformulate my question, saying like, you know, part of this is getting wholesome food into uh, inner city you know, ghetto areas where they, you know, where there is no good option to do that. Okay, so now I come through, I'm back in again, I'm back to Stanford or wherever my university is, and I'm gathering the things that they, that, that they can give me, and then I go out and I try with that. And I keep coming in and out of this university experience. So we talk about lifelong learning, but we pretty much say, you know, it's still using the same old tools, and it's not really about, um, consistently working through your life in, with educational institutions. Usually it's later in life, you'll learn golf and you'll learn you know, flower arranging and some of these other things. Well, that's not, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking people will have things they want to do and online education, modular, granular, just enough, just in time. Now let me try it, now let me refine, now let me find something that takes me the next step. And sort of this combination of, of application and learning. I also think we're going to see some more breakthroughs in peer support, like kind of like the one I just described, but also uh, new tools uh, so that peers can assess each other's work and, and form relationships and so that I can follow. If you graded my essay that I wrote and I liked what you said, I might follow you and we might do a sort of a social networking kind of a thing and I might build um, a set of relationships around learning rather than just around other social factors. And then I might be notified as you find a new course and earn a new badge in something. And, and then there'll be a sort of a viral spread of things that work for people who have common interests. So it may even be that learners start setting their own learning agendas more through sort of a viral peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, set of relationships that emerge. Some people think that uh, institutions can evolve and can make small steps and get there. Uh, others think that, no, it's going to take a... Minerva education or Minerva University or a, you know, Richard Branson Virgin University kind of approach, somebody outside to sort of break down all the barriers and do a start from scratch kind of a model. I think that if it is going to happen in existing higher ed institutions, and I think that it will, <clears throat> we're going to see things like we see from University of Wisconsin and University of Northern Arizona, where they start with their outreach units uh, and, and they 
they allow people who are interested in going that direction to go in that direction, to develop personalized learning models, to develop flex degrees. Um, and then other programs will see that and say, oh, I could do that. You know, that's not that, that's not that different. And I see that they, it's more flexible and you're getting more students and so on. So I think you allow the renegades to, uh, to produce education the way they want it. And then you allow others to follow them. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't, with tenure and you know all kinds of academic freedom um, expectations, it's really very hard to direct a university to move. But there there are incentives that can be offered. Ideally, what we're looking towards is a future where we're courageous enough to make a gigantic change, where we do what Pestalozzi did and say we've got this giant problem. Let's actually try to fix it. We are at that point where our system of education is outdated and we need to dig in with, we need to join for, this is what it is, we need to join forces with the naysayers, we need to join forces with the government people, and we need to ask people honest questions about what they want. We've got a voting population that doesn't necessarily in all cases understand why we're trying to make these changes. The solution is not to call them stupid, but to engage with them and make them understand the things they already know. Because that's the thing. Everybody realizes this already. It's the courage for the change that's difficult. And I think we need to have that kind of courage to lead us to this place where our education system becomes useful for us again. So let's uh, start becoming a little more entrepreneurial and asking ourselves, as Bill Sams put it in a conversation with us, when I, well, it wasn't me who asked the question, but somebody in a conversation I organized with Bill Sams, who's the creator of Epic 2020, something you might want to look at if you haven't seen it yet. They said, you know, what can Penn State do? You know, what can we do to sort of ensure Penn State's future, to save Penn State or something from, you know, the turmoil that might follow? And he said, if you're asking that question, that's the wrong question. If you ask that question, you'll fail. The question you need to ask is, in the future that's out there, what will students need from us? In other words, as more and more open educational resources are out there, as there are more and more opportunities to learn from YouTube and other places and more and more opportunities for learning, what are they going to need from us? And let's figure out how to provide what they need rather than trying to move them into this centuries old box that is a degree where every course is the same length and so on and so on and so on.